30. Philip, therefore, made his way down into Greece, and was met at the city of Lamia by the Aetolians. They were led by Pyrrhus, who had been elected praetor for that year along with Attalus, who was elected in absentia, and they had with them auxiliary forces from Attalus, as well as about one thousand men that Publius Sulpicius had sent them from the Roman fleet. Philip fought two successful battles against this general and these forces, killing about one thousand of the enemy in each of them. Daunted by this, the Aetolians subsequently kept within the walls of the city of Lamia, and Philip, therefore, led his army back to Thalara. This is located on the Malian Gulf, and it was once heavily populated because of its excellent harbor, the safe anchorages in the vicinity, and other advantages for communication by sea and land. Ambassadors from King Ptolemy of Egypt and also from Rhodes, Athens, and Chios, came to Philip at Phalara, their mission being to bring an end to the conflict between him and the Aetolians. The Aetolians also invited Aminander, king of the Athamanians, and a neighbor of theirs, to the negotiations as a peace broker. But everybody's concern was less for the Aetolians, a people more aggressive than Greeks usually are, than for keeping Philip and his kingdom out of the affairs of Greece, where they would constitute a serious threat to the state's independence. Discussion of peace was held over for the council meeting of the Achaeans, and a venue and date for that meeting was established, with a 30-day truce obtained for the interval. The king then left Phalara and came through Thessaly and Boeotia to Chalcis in Euboea. He had heard that Athelus was heading for Euboea with a fleet and he wanted to keep him from its harbors or from landing on its coastline, leaving a force in Chalcis to face Attalus in case he made the crossing. In the meantime, Philip then set off with a few cavalrymen and light infantry, and came to Argos. There, by the vote of the people of Argos, he was given charge of the festival of Hera and of the Neman Games. because the Macedonian kings claimed descent from the city-state, from that city-state. When the festival of Hera was finished, he sent straight from the event to Aegium for the council meeting of his allies, which had been scheduled quite some time before. At the meeting, there was discussion of ending the Aetolian War, so that neither the Romans nor Attalus would have reason to enter Greece. But with the truce barely expired, all such plans were upset when the Aetolians heard that Attalus had reached Aegina, and also that a Roman fleet was anchored off Napactus, invited to intend the council of the Achaeans, at which the deputations involved in the peace discussions at Thalara were also present, the Aetolians, at first, complained only about some minor infractions of the agreement during the truce. They ended, however, by declaring that hostilities could not be terminated unless the Achaeans restored Pylus to the Mycenaeans and unless Antintania were given back to the Romans, and the Ardii to Scardilatus and Pluratus. Philip naturally felt it was outrageous that the conquered party should be offering terms to him, the conqueror. He stated that even on the previous occasion, 
It was not from any hope of non-aggression on the part of the Aetolians that he had listened to peace proposals and concluded a truce. He simply wanted to have all his allies witness that he had sought grounds for peace and the Aetolians grounds for war. And so, without achieving peace, Philip adjourned the council. He left behind 4,000 troops as protection for the Achaeans and accepted their offer of five warships. These, he had decided, he would add to the Carthaginian fleet recently sent to him and to the ships coming from King Prusius in Bithynia. And with this force, he would challenge in a naval battle the long-standing Roman supremacy at sea in the region. Philip himself went back to Argos from the meeting. For now the date of the Nemean games was close at hand, and he wanted them honored by his presence. 31. While the king was preoccupied with organizing the games and was allowing himself more relaxation during the days of the festival season than he could on campaign, Publius Sulpicius set sail with his fleet from Nopactus and put in at a point between Sicyon and Corinth. While the king was preoccupied with organizing the games and was allowing himself more relaxation during the days of the festival season than he could on campaign, Publius Sulpicius set sail with his fleet from Nopactus and put in at a point between Sicyon and Corinth. Here Sulpicius inflicted widespread destruction on farmlands renowned for their fertility, and the news called Philip away from the games. He set off swiftly with his cavalry, ordering the infantry to follow behind. He attacked the Romans as they wandered in disorder through the fields, heavily laden with plunder and with no fear of such an attack, and he drove them back to their ships. The Roman fleet had returned to Napactus, not at all pleased with its hull of booty. For Philip, the remainder of the games had been given added luster by the circulating report of the victory he had won. Slight though it was, it was over the Romans, and the days of the event were celebrated with effusive joy. This was heightened all the more by a popularity-seeking gesture on the part of the king, who set aside his diadem, his purple robe, and the rest of his royal apparel, and put himself in appearance on a level with everybody else. Free societies love nothing more than this. In fact, he might, by such a gesture, have given people some sure hope for their personal freedom, had he not made the whole scene one of filth and degradation by his unconscionable debauchery. Day and night he would prowl around the homes of married men with one or two companions, and the less noticeable he was by bringing himself down to the level of a private citizen, the greater the license he took. In fact, liberty, of which he had given others only the illusion, he had turned entirely to profligacy in his own case. For he did not always gain the ends by money or seduction, but went so far as to add violence to his scandalous behavior, and for husbands and parents alike it was perilous to check the king's sexual appetite with an inconvenient moral firmness. Even one of the most important of the Achaeans, Aratus, saw his wife taken from him, her name was Polycratia, and whisked off to Macedonia with the promise of a royal marriage. After spending the Nemean festival in such debauchery, Philip stayed on a few extra days and then set off for Daimai. His objective was to drive out from Elis an Aetolian garrison that had been invited and subsequently admitted into the city by the Eleans. 
the Achaeans and their commander-in-chief, Cycliadus, met the king at Dimai. The Achaeans felt a passionate hatred for the people of Elis for distancing themselves from the other Achaeans and were furious with the Aetolians, who they thought had incited the Romans to war against them as well. With their armies united, they set off from Dimai and crossed the river Larissus, which separates the territory of Elis from that of Dimai. 32. The first day of their entry into enemy territory, they spent on looting. The following day, they approached the city with their battle line formed up having first sent ahead cavalrymen to provoke the Aetolians, a race ever ready to charge their enemy, by riding up to the gates. What the aggressors did not know was that Sulpicius had crossed from Nopactus to Silene with fifteen ships, and he had set ashore four thousand soldiers, and that he had entered Elise in the dead of night to prevent his column being sighted. As a result, the surprise at recognizing Roman standards and armor against the Aetolians and Elians struck sheer terror into them. At first the king wanted to pull back his troops. Then, seeing his men under pressure in a clash that had started up between the Aetolians and the Thralis, an Illyrian tribe, he himself charged a Roman cohort with his cavalry. In the process, his horse was run through by a javelin, unseating the king and flinging him over his head to the ground. A struggle flared up, furious on both sides, with the king under attack from the Romans and his own men trying to protect him. The king himself put up a remarkable fight although he was obliged to go into battle on foot amidst his horsemen. Then, when the struggle became one-sided and men were falling or being wounded in large numbers all around him, he was seized by his men and put on another horse on which he fled the field. On that day, Philip encamped five miles from the city of Ellis, and on the next he led out all his troops against a nearby stronghold of Elians called Pyrgus. Having heard that a crowd of peasants and their livestock had been driven there through fear of plundering expeditions, in the initial panic caused by his arrival he captured this unarmed rabble, and the plunder taken compensated for his humiliation at Ellis. As phys Philip was dividing up the plunder, and the prisoners, which totaled 4,000 men and roughly 20,000 farm animals of all kinds, a message arrived from Macedonia. A certain Europus, he was told, had captured Lichnidus after bribing the officer in command of the citadel and the garrison. The man was also in control of a number of the villages of the Desaratae, and was given rallying the Dardani to his cause. Philip therefore abandoned the Achaean Aetolian conflict, though he left in place 2,500 fighting men of all categories under the leadership of Menippus and Polyphantus to provide protection for his allies. Leaving Daimai, he made his way through Achaea. Bo Bootia and Euboea, and after a ten-day march, reached Demetrius in Thessaly. 33. At Demetrius, other messengers met the king with news of more serious trouble. They told him that the Dardani had been streaming into Macedonia, that they were now occupying Orestes, and had come down as far as the Argestian plain. It was also rumored amongst the barbarians, they said, that Philip had been killed, 
Now, during the operation on which Philip fought the raiders near Sicayan, he had crashed into a tree when his horse bolted, and there he broke off on a projecting tree branch, one of the horns on his helmet. The horn had been found by an Aetolian taken into Aetolia and brought to Scardil Latis, who was familiar with this decorative feature of the helmet. That was what spread the rumor that the king had been killed. After the king's departure from Achaea, Sulpicius set off with his fleet for Aegina, where he joined up with Attalus. The Achaeans fought a successful battle against the Aetolians and Elians, not far from Messene, and King Attalus and Publius Sulpicius went into winter quarters on Aegina. The consul Titus Quinctius appointed Titus Manlius to Quatrus, dictator for the conduct of elections and the games, but then, at the close of this year, died as a result of his wound. Some sources place his death in Tarentum, others in Campania. And so had arisen a circumstance unparalleled in any war to date. Without fighting a battle of any consequence, two consuls had been killed, leaving the state parentless, as it were. The dictator, Manlius, appointed Gaius Servilius, then serving as Carul Adelio, as his master of horse. On the first day of its session, the Senate instructed the dictator to stage the same great games that the urban praetor Marcus Aemilius had put on in the consulship of Gaius Flaminius and Gnaeus Servilius, and which Aemilius had also promised in a vow would be celebrated five years after that time. The dictator then staged the games and also made a vow that they would be celebrated again five years later. However, two consular armies were now very close to the enemy and without leaders. All else was therefore put aside, and there was but one pressing concern for the senators and people, electing consuls as soon as possible, and electing men possessed of a valor that could resist Punic duplicity. Throughout the war, they reasoned the impulsive and hot-headed character of the commanders had brought disaster, and in that very year the consuls had fallen into a trap they failed to see through being too eager to engage the enemy. But the fact is that the immortal gods had shown pity on the Roman people by sparing the guiltless armies and making the consuls themselves pay for their recklessness with their own lives. 34. The senators were casting about for potential consuls, and one man, Gaius Claudius Nero, stood head and shoulders above the rest. The problem was finding a colleague for him, and though the senators considered Nero an excellent candidate, they also thought him rather too impetuous and volatile for the present military situation and an enemy like Hannibal. They thought his hasty character needed to be tempered by being paired with a cool-headed and prudent colleague. A possibility was Marcus Livius, who at the end of his consulship many years before had been convicted of a crime by the popular assembly, a disgrace he had so taken to heart that he moved to the country and for many years avoided the city and all public gatherings. Some seven years after his condemnation, the consuls Marcus Claudius Marcellus and Marcus Valerius Lavinus had brought him back to town, but he wore old clothes, had long hair and a long beard, and in his demeanor and expression showed that he clearly remembered the humiliation to which he had been subjected. 
The censors Lucius Veturius and Publius Licinius forced him to have his hair and beard cut, and to put aside his rags, and they had him attend Senate meetings and carry out other duties of public life. Even then, however, he would utter only one word in support of a motion or silently vote for it. Until, that is, the time arrived when the case of his relative Marcus Livius Macatus came up, and the man's reputation was at stake. That made Livius stand up and give his opinion before the Senate. Being heard now, after such a long time, he had everybody's eyes riveted on him, and he became a topic of conversation. He had not deserved the wrong he had been done by the people, said the senators, and in so dangerous at war, and in so dangerous a war, the state had suffered a grave loss in not availing itself of the help or advice of a man of such qualities. They further noted that Gaius Nero would be given neither Quintus Fabius nor Marcus Valerius Lavinus as his colleague because the election of two patrician candidates was disallowed, and the same argument applied in the case of Titus Manlius, who, in any case, had refused the consulship when offered it, and would do so again. They would have an excellent pair of consuls, they concluded, if they put Marcus Livius alongside Gaius Claudius as his colleague. The people had no objection to this idea raised by the senators, the only man in the community against it was the one on whom the office was being conferred, and he accused his fellow citizens of capriciousness. They had not felt compassion for him as he defended in rags, he said, and now they were offering him the white toga, which he did not want. This meant offices and punishments being heaped on the same man. If they thought him a good man, why had they condemned him as a criminal and a lawbreaker? If they had found him guilty, why entrust him with a second consulship, after wrongly entrusting him with the first? When he produced these and similar arguments and criticisms, the senators reprimanded him. They reminded him of Marcus Furius, who was actually a recalled exile when he restored his native city to her erstwhile position from which she had been unseated. One must soothe one's country's anger, like that of one's parents, they said, simply by patient acceptance of it. By their concerted efforts, they were then able to make Marcus Olivius consul alongside Gaius Claudius. 35. Two days after the Praetorian elections were held, and Lucius Porcius Licinus, Gaius Mamilius, Gaius Hostilius Cato, and Iulus Hostilius Cato were elected praetors. When the elections were over and the games had been held, the dictator and his master of horse resigned their positions. Gaius Terentius Varro, was sent into Etruria as proprietor so that Gaius Hostilius received of his responsibility there could proceed to Tarentum and take over the army that the consul Titus Quintius had commanded. Lucius Manlius had a diplomatic mission overseas in Greece where he was to keep watch on developments. Also the Olympic Games were to be held that summer, at which there would be large crowds of spectators from around Greece, and so Manlius was also to attend this meeting, if he could get a safe passage through the enemy. Thus he could urge any Sicilian refugees from the war who were in attendance, or any citizens of Tarentum driven out by Hannibal to return home and make them aware that the Roman people were restoring them all the property they had owned before the war. Since it looked as if the oncoming year would be fraught with danger, and there were no consuls in office in the Republic, all eyes turned to the consuls designate. 
people wanted them to conduct a provincial sortition at the earliest opportunity. They wanted each of them to know ahead of time the province he would have and the enemy he would face. There was also a discussion in the Senate, initiated by Quintus Fabius Maximus, of recounseling the two. The animosity between them was well known, and in Livius's case, his personal misfortune had made it even more bitter and acrimonious, believing, as he did, that in his time of adversary, adversity, he had been treated with disdain. He was therefore the more unrelenting of the two, and he insisted there was no need of a reconciliation, that they would each pay greater care and attention to every detail so that a colleague with a grudge would not have the chance to profit from his mistake. Nevertheless, the Senate had its way. The feuding was set aside, and they carried out their public duties with harmony and cooperation. Their provinces were not geographically connected, as in previous years, but set apart at the two ends of Italy. One was assigned Brutium and Lucania to counter Hannibal, and the other Gaul to counter Hasdrubal, who was, word had it, already approaching the Alps. The consul drawing Gaul as his province was instructed to take his pick of the two armies located respectfully, respectively in Gaul and in Etruria, along with which he would also be assigned the troops stationed in the city. The one to whom responsibility for Brutium fell was to mobilize new city legions and take over one of the two armies. The choice was his of the previous year's consuls. The army remaining after the consul had made his choice was to be taken by the proconsul Quintus Fulvius, whose imperium was to run for a year. The Senate had already substituted Tarentum for Etruria as Gaius Hostilius's province, and now they substituted Capua for Tarentum. Hostilius was assigned one legion, which had been commanded by Fulvius the year before. 36. Concern over Hasdrubal's advance on Italy was growing by the day. First, Massilian ambassadors had reported that he had made the passage into Gaul, and that his coming had created a flurry of excitement amongst the Gauls because he was said to have brought a large amount of gold to hire mercenaries. Then came a communique from Sixtius and Tistius and Marcus Rassius, who had been sent on an official fact-finding mission from Rome along with the Massiliate ambassadors. The two had informed the Senate that they had sent men along with Massiliate guides to make a detailed report based on intelligence gathered from Gallic chieftains, who had ties of hospitality with the guides and they said they were certain that Hasdrubal would cross the Alps the following spring with the huge army he had now assembled, and that the only thing stopping them at that time was the inaccessibility of the Alps in winter. Publius Aelius Paetus was elected and installed as augur in place of Marcus Marcellus and Gnaeus Cornelius Dolabella was installed as Rex Secorum in place of Marcus Marcius, who had died two years earlier. In the same year, the census purification was performed by the censors Publius Sempronius Tudetanus and Marcus Cornelius Cathagus. The number of citizens in the census came to 177,000 108, a figure considerably smaller than it had been before the war. It is on record that in that year, for the first time since Hannibal's invasion of Italy, the Comitium was provided with shade. 
It is further recorded that the Roman games were repeated once by the Curule Adeals, Quintus Metellus, and Gaius Servilius, and also that the Plebeian games were repeated by the Plebeian Adults, Gaius Mamilius and Marcus Sicilius, Metellus, for two days. These Adults also offered three statues at the temple of Ceres. There was, moreover, a feast to Jupiter to mark the games. Gaius Claudius Nero and Marcus Olivius then entered office as consuls, Livius for the second time, having already held the sortition for their provinces as consuls designate, they ordered the praetors to hold the sortition for theirs. The urban jurisdiction fell to Gaius Hostilius, but he was further assigned the foreigner's jurisdiction so that the three other praetors could leave the city for their respective duties. Sardinia fell to Iulus Hostilius, Sicily to Gaius Mamilius, and Gaul to Lucius Porcius. A total of 23 legions was then apportioned amongst the magistrates, areas of responsibility as follows. The consuls were to have two legions each, and Spain would be allocated four. The three praetors would take two each to serve in Sicily, Sardinia, and Gaul, respectively. Gaius Torrentius would have two in Etruria, Quintus Fulvius two in Brutium, Quintus Claudius two in the area of Tarentum, and the Salentini, and Gaius Hostilius Tabulus would have one in Capua. Two city legions were also to be raised. The people elected tribunes for the first four legions so allocated, and the consuls sent tribunes to the others. 37. Before the consuls could leave, there was a nine-day ceremony because a shower of stones had fallen at VI. Following the mention of one prodigy, there was the usual phenomenon of others being reported. Lightning was said to have struck the temple of Jupiter and the grove of Marica and Min Minturnae, and the city wall. Lightning was said to have struck the temple of Jupiter and the grove of Marcia at Minturnae, and the city wall and a gate at Atella. To make the report more alarming, the people of Minturnae added that the stream of blood had flowed in a gateway of the temple. At Capua, a wolf had come through a gate at night and badly mauled the guard. These prodigies were expiated with full-grown sacrificial animals, and by decree of the pontiffs, there was a one-day period of public prayer. The nine-day ceremony was then held again, because a shower of stones had been observed in the Armillustrum. 38. No sooner was the public conscience quit of religious concerns than a report came to trouble it once more. At Frisino, it was said, a child had been, been born the size of a four-year-old. And it was not its size that excited wonder as much as the fact that, as was the case at Sinuessa two years earlier, it was unclear at its birth whether it was a male or female. Soothsayers brought in from Etruria declared it to be a foul and loathsome prodigy that the child should be taken from Roman territory kept from all contact with the ground, and sent to the bottom of the sea. It was then placed alive in a box, taken out to sea, and thrown in. The pontiffs also decreed that three groups of nine young girls should proceed through the city singing a hymn. The girls were in the temple of Jupiter, Stator, familiarizing themselves with the hymn which was a composition by the poet Livius. 
when the temple of Queen Juno on the Aventine was struck by lightning. The soothsayers interpreted this as a prodigy affecting only married women, and said the goddess needed to be appeased with a gift. Accordingly, married women with homes in the city of Rome or within ten miles of the city were summoned to the capital by an edict of the Curial Adiles. The women then selected twenty-five of their number as those to whom they should bring a small contribution from their dowries. From the money collected, a golden bowl was made as a gift for the goddess. It was taken to the Aventine, where, with ritual purification and cleansing, sacrifice was offered by the married women. A date for a second sacrifice to the same goddess was immediately fixed by the Decembers, and the order of ceremonies was as follows. Two white cows were led into town through the Porta Carmentalis from the Temple of Apollo and behind them were carried two statues of Queen Juno, made from cypress wood. Then came the twenty-seven young girls, dressed in long robes, singing the hymn to Queen Juno. In those days the hymn might, to the rude intellects of the time, have seemed to have some merit, but cited now it would be thought tasteless and uncouth. The train of girls was followed by the Decembers, wearing laurel garlands and the toga praetexta. The celebrants proceeded from the gate into the forum, along the vicus iugaris. The procession halted in the forum, where the girls, passing a cord through their hands, moved forward, beating their feet in time with their singing. Then, going by way of the Vicus Tuscus and the Velabrum, they came through the Forum Boarium as far as the Clivus Publicius and the Temple of Queen Juno. There the two victims were sacrificed by the Decembers, and the cypress wood statues were carried into the temple. Thirty-eight. With the gods ritually placated, the consuls held a troop leaving, and did so with greater vigor and intensity than anyone remembered levies being conducted in previous years. The fact was that the dread occasioned by the war had been doubled by the advance of a new enemy into Italy, and, in addition, the pool of young men from which they could enroll soldiers was smaller. Accordingly, they forced even the colonists on the coast to provide soldiers, though they were said to have an inviolable right to exemption. When the colonists refused, the consuls publicly announced a date on which each of them was to bring before the Senate the grounds for their exemption. On the appointed day, the following peoples were represented at the Senate. Ostia, Elysium, Antium, Angzur, Minturni, Sunuesa, and from the Adriatic coast, Senna. They all read out their agreements, granting them exemption. But in none of the cases, except those of Antium and Ostia, was the agreement considered valid while an enemy remained in Italy. Even in the case of those two colonies, men of fighting age were bound by oath not to spend more than thirty nights outside the walls of their colony for as long as the enemy remained in Italy. The entire Senate thought that the consuls should take the earliest possible opportunity to go into battle. Hasdrubal had to be confronted during his descent from the Alps, so that he could not 
foment unrest among the Cisalpine Gauls or in Etruria, which was already looking for a chance to rebel. Hannibal, too, had to be kept occupied with his own campaign so there would be no possibility of his leaving Brutium and meeting his brother. Livius, however, was hesitant. He had little confidence in the armies assigned to his areas of responsibility, whereas his colleague could choose from two fine consular armies and a third which was under the command of Quintus Claudius at Tarentum. He had also raised the suggestion of recalling slave volunteers to service. The Senate gave the consuls carte blanche to draw supplementary troops from any source they wished, to select any troops they liked from all the armies, and to conduct exchanges and transfers from the provinces of any men they thought would serve the state well. All these measures were put into effect by the consuls, who acted in perfect harmony. Slave volunteers were drafted into the 19th and 20th legions. Some authorities state that for this campaign, Marcus Livius was also sent powerful auxiliary forces from Spain by Publius Scipio, and that these comprised 8,000 Spaniards and Gauls, about 2,000 legionaries and 1,800 cavalrymen, a mixture of Numidians and Spaniards. They add that Marcus Lucretius brought these troops by sea, and that Gaius Mamilius also sent approximately 3,000 archers and slingers from Sicily. 39. The alarm in Rome was heightened by a letter from the praetor Lucius Porcius in Gaul, reporting that Hasdrubal had moved from his winter quarters and was already making his way over the Alps. Hasdrubal had mobilized and put under arms 8,000 Ligurians, said Porcius, and these would join him once he had crossed into Italy, unless someone were sent into Ligeria to keep them occupied with a war there. His own army was weak, he added but he would advance as far as he thought he could in safety. The letter obliged the consuls to complete their troop levy post-haste and leave for their provinces earlier than they had intended. Their plan was for each to keep the enemy bottled up in his province and not permit them to meet up or join forces. They were greatly aided in this strategy by an erroneous assumption on Hannibal's part. Although he had expected his brother to cross into Italy that summer, Hannibal thought back on his own experiences, the Rhone crossing and then the Alps, and five months of battling men and the terrain, and he did not anticipate that Hasdrubal's journey would be anything like as easy and swift as it turned out to be. And thanks to that, he was late moving out of his winter quarters. In fact, everything went more quickly and easily for Hasdrubal than either he, himself, or anyone else had expected. For not only did the Arverni, and then other Gallic and Alpine tribes, welcome his coming, but they even went to war alongside him. Furthermore, he was leading his army along a path which impassable earlier, had now, thanks to his brother's crossing, became a largely open thoroughfare, and in addition, their route lay through peoples whose character had now been softened, thanks to the Alps being regularly traversed over a 12-year period, uh, twelve year period. For before that, having had no visits from outsiders and not being accustomed to setting eyes on a stranger in their land, they were xenophobic towards the entire human race. At first, in fact, they had no idea of the Carthaginian's destination, and they had believed that the, his objective was their rocky homes and strongholds, and plunder in the shape of animals and men. 
Then word had reached them of the Punic War, in which Italy had been ablaze for eleven years, making it clear that the Alps were merely a passageway, and that two mighty cities, separated from each other by a large expanse of sea and land, were in a struggle for power and dominion. Such were the factors that had opened up the Alps for Hasdrubal. However, what he had gained by the speed of his march, a delay at Placentia, on which he mounted an unsuccessful blockade rather than a direct assault, subsequently cancelled out. Hasdrubal had thought the town, lying on a plain, would be easy to take, and the renown of the colony had induced him to make the attempt. By destroying that city, he thought, he would strike terror in all the others. He not only slowed his own progress by the siege, but he had also held up Hannibal, who was moving from his winter quarters after receiving news that his brother's crossing had gone much faster than he had expected. For Hannibal now began to take into account what a slow process the investment of cities was, and he also remembered how unsuccessful his own attempt on that same colony had been on his victorious return from the Trebia. 40. The consuls set off from the city in opposite directions for what were almost two simultaneous wars, and that only increased people's worries, for they recalled the disasters that Hannibal's initial arrival had brought on Italy, and they were also tortured by the question of what gods would be so kind to the city and empire as to grant the state success on both fronts at the one time. To that point, they had kept things going by compensating for reserves. Sorry. To that point, they had kept things going by compensating for reverses with successes. When Roman fortunes had taken a fall at Trasimene and Cannae, victorious campaigns in Spain had raised them again. Later, when successive defeats in Spain had partly destroyed two armies and two fine commanders had been lost, numerous successes in Italy and Sicily had come along to support the shaken republic. Besides the geographic separation, the fact that one of the theaters of war lay at the world's end had given them some breathing space. Now, however, two wars had been brought into Italy, Two famous commanders stood on different sides of the city of Rome, and it was on one spot that the whole brunt and burden of the perilous war had become focused. The first of the two to gain a victory would join forces with the other in a matter of days. They were also frightened because of the previous year, darkened by the deaths of the two consuls. Such were the cares tormenting people when they sent off the consuls as they left for the, their assignments. It is recorded that Quintus Fabius gave a warning to Marcus Olivius, still full of resentment towards his fellow citizens, as he left for the campaign. Fabius told him not to be hasty in engaging before he got to know the sort of enemy he was facing, to which Olivius replied that he would take the field the moment he set eyes on the enemy's column. When asked why he was in such a hurry, Livius retorted, Either I shall acquire a brilliant reputation from the enemy, or I shall derive pleasure from the defeat of my fellow citizens, a pleasure well deserved, even if it is not honorable. Before the consul Claudius reached his province, Gaius Hostilius Tubulus attacked Hannibal with a number of light-armed cohorts as he was leading his army along the far edge of Tarentine territory into that of the Salentini. The Carthaginian's column was not in regular formation, and Tubulus struck terrible panic into it, killing roughly 4,000 men 
in capturing nine military standards. Quintus Claudius had had his troops billeted throughout the cities in the land of the Salentini, and had moved out of winter quarters when he heard of the enemy's movement. Now, to avoid coming to grips with two armies at the same time, Hannibal struck camp from the area of Tarentum by night and withdrew into Brutium. Claudius steered his army towards the Salentini, and Hostilius, who was on his way to Capua, met up with the consul at Venusia. There, 40,000 infantry and 2,500 cavalry were selected from the two armies for the consul's operation against Hannibal. Hostilius was instructed to lead the remaining troops to Capua, where he was to hand them over to the proconsul Quintus Fulvius. 41. Hannibal now brought together all the troops that had been kept in winter quarters or in the garrisons in Brutian territory. He then came towards Grumentum in Lucania, hoping to recover the towns that had, out of fear, defected to the Romans. The Roman consul also marched to Grumentum from Venusia, taking care to reconnoitre the roads, and he encamped about a mile and a half from the enemy. The rampart of the Carthaginian camp seemed to be hard up against the walls of Grumentum, with a mere half mile between them. Between the Punic encampment and the Roman lay some level ground with treeless hills rising up to the left of the Carthaginians and to the right of the Romans. The hills aroused misgivings in neither side, providing, as they did, no tree cover or hiding places for an ambush. In the middle of the level ground, a number of forays from the two armies' advanced post precipitated skirmishingly, skirmishing hardly worth the mention. It was apparent, however, that the Romans' one aim was to prevent his enemy's departure. Hannibal, on the other hand, in his eagerness to get away from there, reputedly took the field in full force. The consul Nero then resorted to the enemy's tactics, which were all the more appealing because there could be little fear of an ambush on such open hills. He ordered five cohorts, with an additional force of five maniples, to cross the mountain ridge at night, and position themselves on the far slope of the hills. Details of when the men were to emerge from ambush and attack the enemy he gave to the officers he was sending with them, Tiberius Claudius, Asilus, a military tribune, and Publius Claudius, a prefect of the Allies. Nero himself led all his troops, infantry, and cavalry out to battle at dawn. Shortly afterwards, Hannibal also put up his signal for battle, and shouting arose in the camp as his men rushed to arms, Cavalry and infantry then came racing from the Carthaginian camp and all over the plain. They made a disordered charge at the enemy. When the consul saw their disarray, he ordered Gaius Orunculius, military tribune of the 3rd Legion, to send the cavalry of his legion against the enemy with all the force he could. The Carthaginians had scattered like animals all over the plain, said Nero so much so that they could be mown down and crushed before they formed up. 42. Hannibal had not yet left the camp when he heard the shouting from the battlefield. The uproar sent him into action, and he rapidly led his other troops against the enemy. The cavalry charge had already struck panic into the closest of the Carthaginians and the Roman infantry. The first legion and the left allied contingent was also advancing into battle. In complete disorder, the enemy engaged in whatever 
chance put in their way, foot soldier or cavalryman. The battle spread as reinforcements came up and gained intensity as more men rushed into the fray. Despite the uproar and panic all around, Hannibal might still have formed up his men as they fought. Not an easy task for any but a seasoned forest with a seasoned commander. Had it not been for the shouting from the cohorts and the maniples who came running down the hills, hearing this behind them made the men fear that they might be cut off from their camp. They were panic-stricken, and a route began all over. A route began. <clears throat> Here we go. Hearing this behind them made the men fear that they might be cut off from their camp. They were panic-stricken, and a rout began all over the battlefield. Losses were diminished only by the camp's proximity, which made flight shorter for the demoralized Carthaginians. For the cavalry were hard on their heels, and the cohorts had attacked the flanks side-on, running downhill on a clear and easy path. Even so, more than 8,000 men were killed and more than 700 taken prisoner, with the capture of nine military standards. The elephants had been of no use in such a swift and disordered battle, but four were killed and two captured. Losses for the triumphant Romans and their allies were around 500. The following day, the Carthaginian made no move. The Roman commander led his troops out for the fight, but seeing no one come to face him, then gave orders for the spoils to be gathered up from the enemy dead, and for the bodies of his own men to be brought together and buried. After that, for several days in succession, Nero came forward so close to the enemy gates as to give the impression that he was making an assault. Finally, Hannibal simply left behind on the side of the camp, facing his enemy, a large number of fires and tents, and a few Numidians, who were to let themselves be seen on the rampart and at the gates. He then set off at the third watch and proceeded towards Apulia. At dawn, the Roman force came up to the rampart. The Numidians then followed the prearranged plan of putting in a brief appearance in the gateways and on the rampart, and after duping the enemy for some time, they galloped off and joined their comrades on the march. The consul now observed that all was still in the camp, and that even the few men who had been walking about at dawn were nowhere to be seen, and so he sent two horsemen forward into the camp to investigate. On learning that all was secure, he ordered the advance into the camp and after staying long enough only for the men to run off to gather spoils, he sounded the retreat, and led the troops back long before the onset of night. The next day he set out at dawn. He followed his enemy with forced marches, guided by reports, and the tracks left by their calm, and caught up with them not far from Venusia. There, too, there was a scrappy engagement, in which more than 2,000 Carthaginians were killed. The Carthaginian commander then headed for Metapontum, taking mountain roads by night, so as to give the Romans no scope for battle. From Metapontum, Hanno, who had been the garrison commander there, was sent with a handful of men into Brutium to put together a new army. After adding Hanno's troops to his own, Hannibal took the same roads back to Venusia by which he had come, and then went on to Canusium. At no point had Nero relaxed his pursuit of the enemy, and when he himself was setting out for Metapontum, he had called Quintus Fulvius to Lucania, so the region should not be undefended. 43. Meanwhile, after commencing the siege of Placentia, 
Hasdrubal had sent off four Gallic horsemen and two Numidians with a letter for Hannibal. They traveled practically the length of Italy through the midst of the enemy, but while they were following Hannibal during his withdrawal to Metapontum, they came upon roads they did not know and ended up in Tarentum. They were then brought to the proprietor Quintus Claudius by some Romans who were out foraging in the fields. At first they tried to mislead Claudius with evasive responses, but then the treat of torture forced the truth out of them, and they told them that they were bearing a letter to Hannibal from Hasdrubal. The men and the letter, still sealed, were put in the charge of the military tribune Lucius Virginius to be taken to the consul Claudius Nero, and an escort of two squadrons of Samnites was sent along with them. When the company reached the consul, the letter was read, with the help of an interpreter, and the prisoners were interrogated. Claudius at that point decided that the crisis facing the state did not call for an operation based on conventional strategy which each consul engaging the enemy assigned to him by the Senate and functioning within his specific area of responsibility with his own army. There had to be some bold new stroke, something startling and unexpected and enterprise that would terrify the citizens as much as the enemy, but which successfully concluded would turn great fear into great joy. Nero then sent Hasdrubal's letter to the Senate in Rome, and also explained his plans to the members. Since Hasdrubal was informing his brother by letter to, of his intention to meet him in Umbria, Nero advised the senators to recall a legion to Rome from Capua to hold a levy of troops in Rome and to face the enemy at Narnia with the army from the city. Such was Nero's letter to the Senate, but he also sent men ahead through the territory of Lerinum and that of the Mirosini and the Frentani and the Praetuti, that is the lands through which would be leading his army. The men were to instruct all these peoples to carry provisions from their farms and cities to the roadside, ready for his men to eat, and to bring out horses and other animals of conveyance, so that there would be plenty of transport for those suffering for, from fatigue. Nero himself selected from his entire army the strongest citizen and allied troops, picking out 6,000 infantry and 1,000 cavalry. He announced that he intended to seize the closest city in Lucania, along with its Carthaginian garrison, and ordered this hand-picked force all to be ready for the march. He set off at night and then veered towards Pessinum. In fact, the consul was marching with all the haste he could muster to join his colleague, having left his legate Quintus Catius in charge of the camp. 44. In Rome, the alarm and panic was no less than it had been two years earlier when the Carthaginian camp had been pitched before the walls and gates of the city. People were undecided whether to praise or condemn the consul's daring march, and what was most unfair was the obvious fact that judgment of it would depend on the outcome. A camp had been left without a leader close to an enemy like Hannibal, it was said, and left with an army which had been depleted of all its strength, all its elite troops, and the consul had made a show of heading into Lucania, while in fact he was making for Pisenum and Gaul leaving behind his camp, whose security depended entirely on the enemy's misperception on his ignorance of the fact that the commander 
and part of the army had left. What would happen, they asked, if that became known? What if Hannibal decided either to use his entire army to chase Nero and his 6,000 troops, or to attack the camp that was left wide open to looting? without strength, without supreme command, and without auspices. The past defeats in that war and the violent deaths of two consuls the previous year filled people with dread, and they noted that all those setbacks had occurred when there was only one enemy commander and one enemy army in Italy. Now there were two Punic Wars in the country, two mighty armies and practically two Hannibals. For, like Hannibal, Hasdrubal was also the son of Hamilcar, and he was just as dynamic a leader as his brother. He, too, had had many, many years of training in warfare against the Romans in Spain, and he had made a name for himself through his twin victories and the destruction of two armies with their famous commanders. In terms of the speed of his journey from Spain, at least, and his success, of inciting Gallic tribes to war, he had more reason to boast than Hannibal himself, for Hasdrubal had put together his army of his in that same region where Hannibal had lost most of his soldiers to hunger and the freezing temperatures, which were the most wretched ways to die. Men well acquainted with the Spanish situation would make the further point that in engaging with Gaius Nero, Hasdrubal would not be facing a commander unfamiliar to him. In fact, they said, when Hasdrubal happened to be caught in a difficult pass, he had duped and hoodwinked Nero like a little boy with a charade of framing terms of peace. People also assumed the enemy's military strength to be greater and their own smaller than was actually the case, for fear always leans towards a pessimistic analysis. 45. When he had put enough distance between himself and the enemy to be able to disclose his plan quite safely, Nero briefly addressed his men. No commander, he told them, had ever had a plan that looked more foolhardy, but, in fact, more sound than his. He was leading them to certain victory, he said, for his colleague had left for the campaign only after receiving from the Senate cavalry and infantry enough, and more to meet his needs, forces stronger and better equipped than if he were going to face Hannibal himself. And now they themselves would tip the scale completely by whatever additional strength they brought to the fight. Once it was simply heard on the battlefield, and he would see to it that it was not heard earlier, that a second consul and a second army had arrived that would certainly bring them victory. Hearsay decides the outcome of war, he continued, and insignificant factors push the mind towards hope or fear, and they themselves would reap nearly all the glory in the event of success. It was always the last factor in the equation that was regarded as decisive. They would see, he added, people's admiration and support for them as they marched by. And it was indeed true that they were everywhere marching along amidst vows and prayers and words of praise from rows of men and women who had come pouring from all over the countryside. Defenders of the state, they called them, and champions of the city of Rome and her empire. In those men's weapons and sword arms, they declared, lay their own and their children's security and liberty. They prayed to all the gods and goddesses to grant the soldiers a prosperous journey, a successful battle, and swift victory over the enemy. They prayed, too, that they would be obliged to repay the vows they had made on their behalf, that just as they were now anxiously sending them on their way, so in a few days they would come happily to meet them as they rejoiced in their victory. Then, 
they all issued invitations pro offered gifts and persistently entreated the men to take whatever could serve their own or their animals needs and take it from them rather than others they showered everything on them without stint the soldiers restraint was equally impressive they would not take anything beyond their needs there was no dawdling no stopping and breaking formation to eat they marched day and night barely giving themselves enough rest to meet the body's natural requirements men had also been sent ahead of Nero's colleague to announce the army's coming and to ask whether he wanted them to arrive secretly or openly by day or at night, and also to ask whether they would be housed in the same camp or another. Livius felt arriving secretly during the night was preferable. 46. The tablet had been circulated in the camp by the consul Livius. Tribunes were ordered to house tribunes, centurions to house centurions, cavalrymen, cavalrymen, and foot soldiers, foot soldiers. For enlarging the camp was a bad idea, Livius decided. The enemy might surmise that the other consul had arrived. In fact, packing more men into a small place to erect their tents was going to prove easier because Claudius's troops had brought with them for the oper operation almost nothing but their weapons. However, the column had been enlarged with volunteers at, as it moved along. Veterans, men whose service was not over, sorry, veterans, men whose service was over and offered to join them, and so had younger men who had raced to enlist. Claudius had enrolled any whose physique and bodily strength seemed to qualify them for fighting. The camp of the other consul, Livius, was at Sina, and Hasdrubal was only half a mile away. So as he drew near, Nero halted where he had cover from the mountains in order not to enter the camp before nightfall. Then the men filed in silently and were all taken to their tents and offered hospitality by soldiers of their own rank amid enthusiastic rejoicing on everyone's part. The next day there was a council of war which the praetor Lucius Porcius Licinus also attended. Licinus had his camp beside that of the consuls and before their arrival he had run the whole gamut of military tactics on the enemy, leading his force over the high country and seizing narrow passes to obstruct their passage or else harassing their column with attacks to the flanks or rear. And so, on this occasion, he attended the consul of war. Many at the meeting inclined to the opinion that engaging the enemy should be delayed. This would give Nero time to refresh his men, now exhausted from the journey and lack of sleep, and also allow him a few days to familiarize himself with his enemy. Nero, however, proceeded not simply to urge the other course, but abjectly pleaded with them. What had made his strategy sound was his speed, he said, and they should not now make it a risky one by delaying. It was a bluff that had left Hannibal virtually frittering away his time without attacking a camp that lacked its commander, or taking to the road to pursue him, and that bluff would not last long. But before Hannibal made a move, he explained as Drubal's army could be destroyed, and they could return to Apulia, delaying and giving the enemy time meant both betraying that camp of his to Hannibal, and also opening for him a path into Gaul, enabling him to join up with Hasdrubal at his leisure and wherever he wished. 
know they should lose no time in giving the signal and going out to battle, he said. They must take full advantage of the bluff that had been pulled on the enemy, who was absent, and on one who was present, while the one still did not know that he was facing fewer troops than he thought, and the other that he faced more and stronger ones. When the consul adjourned, the signal for battle was put up, and they went forward immediately to battle stations. forty seven by now the enemy were standing in formation before their camp what delayed the engagement was the fact that as hasdrubal rode forward before the standards he picked out amongst the enemy old shields that he had not previously seen and horses that were somewhat emaciated in addition the roman numbers seemed unusually large guessing what was in fact the case he quickly sounded the retreat he also sent men to the river from which the Romans were drawing their water to take some prisoners who could be inspected for signs of more than usual sunburn, as would be found after a recent march. At the same time, Hasdrubal ordered men to ride around the Roman encampment at a remote and, ex and examine at a remove and examine whether the rampart had been extended anywhere. These men were also to keep their ears open for whether there were one or two bugle calls. This was all duly reported back to Hasdrubal, and he was taken in by the fact that there had been no enlargement of the camps. There were two camps, just as there had been before the other consul's arrival, one belonging to Marcus Livius, and the other to Lucius Porcius. But in neither had there been any extension of the fortifications to accommodate more tents. Hasdrubal, however, was a veteran commander used to facing a Roman enemy, and the news the men brought that there had been one bugle call in the praetor's camp, but two in the consuls, caused him some concern. There must be two consuls there, he thought and the question that tormented him was how one of them had slipped away with Hannibal. The last thing he could have suspected was what had actually happened, namely that Hannibal was the victim of such an enormous subterfuge that he had no idea of the whereabouts of the commander and the army that had been encamped right next to him. It must be, thought Hasdrubal, that his brother had not dared pursue the consul because he had suffered a serious defeat. In fact, Hasdrubal was very much afraid that things had gone badly wrong, that he himself had come too late to help, and that the Romans were now enjoying the same success in Italy as they were in Spain. Sometimes, though, the thought would cross his mind that his letter might not have reached Hannibal, that the consul had intercepted it, and that he had now come with all speed to crush him. Vexed by such worries, Hasdrubal had the fires extinguished, and at the first watch he gave the signal for the men to gather their equipment in silence. He then ordered them to move out. In all the consternation and confusion of the night, little attention was paid to the two guides, one of whom settled into a hiding place of which he had earlier made a mental note, while the other swam across the river Metaurus at a point where he knew it was shallow. Deserted by the guides, the column at first drifted aimlessly through the countryside, and a number of men, exhausted and weary from lack of sleep, threw themselves down at various points, leaving only a few around the standards. Hasdrubal issued instructions for them to advance along the river bank until the light should arrive to show the way, but he would double back when he lost his way along the twisting and turning banks of the winding river, and he made little headway, he decided, therefore to cross as soon as dawn revealed a suitable fording point. 
But the further he retreated from the sea, the higher the banks became on both sides of the river, and he failed to find any shallow spots. Frittering away the day like this, he gave his enemy time to catch up with him. Forty-eight. Nero came on the scene first, at the head of the entire Roman cavalry. Then Porcius followed with the light infantry. They harassed and charged the weary column from every direction, and the Carthaginian commander now abandoned his march, which resembled a flight intending to lay out a camp on a knoll overlooking the river bank. At that point, Livius arrived with all the heavy infantry deployed and armed not for marching, but for immediate engagement. The Romans then combined all their forces, and the line was arranged for battle. Claudius, taking the right wing, and Livius, the left, with command of the entire center assigned to the praetor. Hasdrubal now gave up constructing his camp. He saw that he had to fight. He positioned his elephants in the front line before the standards. Next to them, on the left wing, and facing Claudius, he set the Gauls, less because he had confidence in them than because he thought that they were feared by the enemy. The right wing, facing Marcus Livius, he took for himself and the Spaniards, and it was in these veteran troops that he placed his greatest hope. The Ligurians were stationed in the middle, to the rear of the elephants. But the formation had depth rather than breadth, and the Gauls received cover from a hill projecting before them. The section of the front line held by the Spaniards engaged the Roman left wing, and the entire Roman right stood beyond the fighting, and for now remained out of it, the hill before them preventing them from making any frontal or flank attack. There was a huge clash between Livius and Hasdrubal, with terrible loss of life on both sides. This was where the two commanders stood, and here stood most of the Roman infantry and cavalry, as well as the Spaniards. Veteran troops acquainted with the Roman way of fighting, and the Ligurians a tough race in battle. It was to this area, too, that the elephants were driven with their initial charge they had caused havoc amongst the front lines and had also made the standards give ground then as the clash and shouting intensified there was less of a possibility of controlling them and they moved about between the two lines as though uncertain to which side they belonged and not unlike rudderless ships claudius called out to his men so what was the point of covering so much ground at such speed, as he tried, without success, to march his troops up the hill before him. When he saw it was impossible to get through to the enemy in that quarter, he withdrew a number of cohorts from the right wing, where he could see they would be standing around inactive rather than engaged in the fight. These he led around behind the fighting line, and made a charge on the enemy's left wing that surprised not only the enemy, but his own side as well. Such was the speed of the maneuver that the cohorts made an appearance on the flank, and then, at the next moment, were attacking the rear. So it was that the Spaniards and Ligurians were being cut down on every side, at the front, on the flank, and at the rear and by now the slaughter had reached the Gauls. In that quarter, the fighting was the lightest. Most of the men had left their positions. They had slipped away in the night and were lying asleep throughout the countryside, and those present were exhausted from the journey and lack of sleep, physically incapable of exerting themselves and barely able to carry their weapons on their shoulders. And by now, 
It was the middle of the day, and thirst and the heat left them gasping, ready to be cut down or captured in droves. 49. As for the elephants, more were killed by their own drivers than by the enemy. The drivers kept a workman's chisel and a mallet at hand, and when the animals began to get out of control and charge their own side, the keeper would place the chisel between the ears at the point where the neck joins the head and drive it home with all his strength. That it was found was the swiftest way of dispatching a beast of such a size. Once the animals left the drivers, no hope of controlling them. And the first... <clears throat> That, it was found, was the swiftest way of dispatching a beast of such a size, once the animals left the drivers no hope of controlling them. And the first man to have instituted the practice was Hasdrubal, a leader with a great reputation for his other achievements, and above all, for that battle. It was he who kept his men fighting to, by encouraging them and facing the dangers with them, it was he who energized them, alternating entreaties and reproaches, when they were worn out and given up the fight from weariness and exhaustion. It was he who called back men in flight and rekindled the battle where it had been abandoned at several points. In the end, when fortune clearly favored his enemy, he refused to survive the great army that had followed the fame of his name and galloped straight into a Roman cohort. There, fighting, he died a death that was appropriate for a son of Hamilcar, the brother of Hannibal. At no time in that war were so many of the enemy killed in a single battle, and, with the loss of their commander and their army, the Carthaginians seemed to have been repaid for Cannae with a disaster of equal magnitude. The enemy dead totaled, 57,000, 5,400 were taken prisoner, and there were large quantities of booty of all kinds, including gold and silver. More than 4,000 of the Roman citizens who had been prisoners in enemy hands were also recovered. That was some consolation for the soldiers lost in the battle, for it was no means a bloodless victory, with Roman and allied losses around the 8,000 mark. How far the victors felt that they had had more than enough bloodshed and killing became clear the following day. Word came to the consul Livius that the Cisalpine Gauls and Ligurians, who had either taken no part in the battle or had escaped the slaughter, were retreating in a single column with no recognized leader and no standards, and in no formation, and with no system of command. They could all be wiped out if a cavalry squadron were let loose on them, he was told. No, said Livius. Let some of them survive to tell of the enemy's defeat and our courage. 50. Nero left on the night following the battle and moving the column along at greater speed than on his outward journey, he reached his base camp and the enemy in five days. There were smaller crowds along his route. No messenger had preceded him, but they welcomed his coming with such elation as to be almost beside themselves with joy. As for Rome, words cannot be found to recount or describe either of its emotional states neither that in which the city anxiously awaited the outcome, nor that with which it received the news of the victory. Throughout the days after the news arrived that the consul Claudius had left, at no time between sunrise and sunset did any senator leave the senate house or the presence of magistrates, nor the people the forum. Married women, unable to provide maternal assistance, themselves turned to prayer and appeals to heaven 
roaming through all the shrines and urgently petitioning the gods with entreaties and vows. While the city was gripped by such anxiety and tension, a vague rumor arose that two riders from Narnia had reached the camp that had been set up to barricade the entrance to Umbria, and that they brought news of a massacre of the enemy. At first this merely went into men's ears without registering in their minds. The news was too great, too joyous to be mentally absorbed or believed. Besides, the very speed of its arrival made acceptance difficult. The battle reportedly took place only two days earlier. Then a letter from Lucius Manlius Asidinus was brought from the camp, and its subject was the arrival of the two Narnian riders. That dispatch, borne through the forum to the Praetor's Tribunal, brought the senators forth from the Senate House, and such was the rush and scramble with which the people converged on the doors of the Senate, that had that the messenger could not get near it. Instead, he was pulled away by the crowds around him, who repeatedly asked him questions and noisily demanded that the letter be read out on the rostra before it was read in the Senate. Eventually, these people were pushed aside and restrained by the magistrates, and the glad tidings could be dispensed to minds unable to cope with them. The letter was read aloud, first in the Senate, and then in the popular assembly, and depending on the individual temperament, some felt unreserved joy, while others were going to withhold belief, until they heard about it from the envoys, or a dispatch from the consuls. 51. Then news came that the consular envoys themselves were coming. At that point, People of all ages ran to meet them, every one of them wishing to be the first to drink in such joy, with eyes and ears, and there was one long line reaching all the way to the Mulvian Bridge. The envoys were Lucius Viturius Philo, Publius Licinius Varus, and Quintus Caecilius Metellus, with crowds of people of every class milling about them, they came forward into the forum, while some asked the envoys themselves and others their attendants to tell them what had happened. And as each person heard the news that the enemy army and its leader were destroyed, that the Roman legions were unharmed, and that the consuls were safe, they would immediately go on to share their joy with others. It was with difficulty that the envoys made their way to the Senate House, and with much greater difficulty that the crowd was pushed aside to stop the public from intermingling with the senators. Then the letter was read out in the Senate, after which the envoys were taken over into the popular assembly. Once the letter had been read out there, Lucius Viturius himself gave a fuller account of the events, which was received with great approval, and, final, and finally, even with noisy applause from the entire gathering, for people could barely contain their delight. Then they dispersed, some making the rounds of the temples of the gods to offer thanks, and others going home to share the happy news with their wives and children. To mark the consuls Marcus Livius and Gaius Claudius's destruction of the enemy commander and his legions while preserving intact their own army, the Senate decreed three days of public thanksgiving. The praetor Gaius Hostilius made the announcement of the period of thanksgiving before an assembly, and the ceremonies were held by both men and women. All the temples saw the same large crowds throughout the three-day period, as women and their children dressed in their finest clothes and freed now from all fear, gave thanks to the immortal gods, as though the war were over. That victory also affected the state's financial workings. From then on, people dared to carry on business as a peacetime, selling, buying, putting out loans, and repaying them. The consul Gaius Claudius had been careful to keep Hasdrubal's head and bring it with him. When he returned to his camp, he ordered it to be tossed before 
the forward post of the enemy. He also had his African prisoners put on display for the enemy wearing their chains, and two he released, telling them to go to Hannibal and recount to him what had taken place. Shaken by this great blow to his people as well as his family, Hannibal is said to have stated that he now saw clearly the destiny of Carthage. He struck camp, intending to gather together in Brutium, in a, the furthest corner of Italy, all those supporting troops to whom he could not give protection if they were widely dispersed. He then moved all the people of Metapontum from their homes, along with all such Lucanians as were under his control, and took them over into Brutian territory.